Welcome to Hawkett Podcast. Today's guest is Amy Taylor, a professional model, escort, licensed commercial pilot, and travel enthusiast. How's it going? It's going. Thanks for having me. It's nice thank, to see you. Thank you so much for coming on today. So how have you been doing lately? What you been up to? Same old, same old. It's uh, beginning to be summertime in New York, which is sort of the the humid and hot and sweaty season. But at least it's not freezing cold or snow. So we like that part. Uh, I leave a couple times a month to other states, but it's a uh, it's a breathlessly exciting place to call home, New York. It's it's a lot, but uh, no day's boring in this town. Mm-hmm. So how's New York been in the last few months? You know, like every big city, it got hit hard a few years ago by COVID, and it's been limping back ever since. Uh, Certainly isn't quite where it was before COVID, but every month it recovers more. There's a lot of nonsense. Look, it's 8.3 million people on one island in Manhattan alone. Um, But it's very exciting. Uh, Vacant shops have been being filled every week. I walk by a new tenant somewhere. Restaurants are back. People are out. Um, I don't think you can keep New Yorkers down. I think they're just that kind of people that they just don't stop. It's, it's nonsense. It's like if someone had these big world cities, you know, Delhi, Paris, London, New York, they, they just don't quit. It's nonsense. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went to India a few months ago and I was amazed how people are like up at like 10 o'clock in the morning, just out and about. And here people are like already in bed and people start their, their night and their like livelihood. The nightlife around that time in India, compared to here, especially in LA, everyone's usually a bed at home in bed or starting. Like people who go out a lot at night start their day. Yeah, I used to, I lived in LA. I think we chatted. I lived in LA for twenty three years. I definitely miss the weather. You guys win on weather. Southern California, the best in the world. Every time I go back once a month, I'm like, maybe I should have stayed, and maybe I'll go back. Um, uh, I lived on the beach and then in downtown LA and and I miss it. But you're right. It's an early town. Everybody wants to get up and surf or just be up with that beautiful desert morning light that makes you a thousand times prettier, that light. That's why the mm-hmm. movie industry moved there. There's nothing like that desert light. Las Vegas and Phoenix also. But because you guys have the ocean, it's the best of both worlds. I, I think they asked a lot of people if they could live anywhere in the world. You know, money's no object. Work, family's no object. and most people picked Southern California. Hmm. And I'm the opposite of that. I like the weather and all, but everything else. Nah, really? I'm done. I'm, yeah, I'm done. With that. You think you're going to leave and go somewhere with more seasons or? Yeah, I like to experience more. I'm like more like uh, like the mountain type person. I would like to go I live right. up in the mountains. I'm not really a beach person, never been. So I like to move like. Dirty to sand, state. right? So I like to move to like a state that has like mountains and like snow and stuff. Yeah. Well, seasons are lovely. It makes time feel different. Time feels more precious here in New York and that each month is basically 10 degrees different from the last month up or down. And so you feel the passage of time in a more precious way, which is maybe why everybody hustles so much here because they feel it more. Also, it's expensive, duh. But it's LA the same here is expensive as well, but it's probably right? more in New York. Uh, you're right, but not much. They're the two worst. We picked, you and I picked the two most expensive places to live. Great. Good job, guys. <laughs> so, but you're right. I agree with you on the beach. I was very excited a few years ago to buy a condo on the beach, box checked in life. And then I never went down there because it was just filthy, dirty sand. And it would come into the house if the wind blew. And uh, I don't think I ever need to live on the sand again. Yeah, I've gone to the beach a couple of times. I like how how do people come here? It's like always dirty. There's trash in the sand. Like it, the sand just looks like I don't know. It just looks dirty. Yeah, it's not like Caribbean. Uh, it's not. And uh, and then yeah, there's like sand fleas. I know, but like I don't know. The ocean's nice to look at. Uh, uh, it's kind of like New York is nice to look at at night. You don't see any of the the garbage or the <laughs> rats. You just see the city lights, and it makes you think it's nicer than it is. <laughs> So um, let's start. I like asking, yeah. asking my guests this question. So where are you from? Tell us your origin story. Origin story. I sound like a villain. Um, some would say, I think I'm not, but um, I, uh, my father taught at Penn State. So I was born in the smack dab in the middle of Pennsylvania. Uh, but then quickly we moved when I was a very young child. I basically don't remember Pennsylvania. We moved to Northern California uh, because of his work. And I went to early you know, pre uh, grammar school there and high school. 
And then I moved to the California Bay Area for college. I went to school in the East Bay. Uh, and then I worked, uh, my undergraduate degree was in molecular biology. And then I worked in biotech for about two years afterwards. Uh, turned out I hated it. <laughs> Why so? Uh, I had a difficult time with animal sacrifice. I understand it has to be done. I'm totally pro medicine and testing. It's what we do, but it was pretty hard on my soul day after day. And again, I know it has to be done, but it was hard on me. Also, being a bench scientist with only a bachelor's degree uh, and trying to live in the San Francisco Bay Area, I was spending money to do that job. On I was not making enough to even pay for gas and rent. And I lived in a studio in a bad city and I still couldn't make it work. Um, so I pivoted. I uh, only got into grad uh, business school in LA. So I went down there to get an advanced degree, pivoted um, and uh, and started working for an oil company. All the while, ever since I was a teenager, I've been modeling. That happened by accident. Got scouted in a mall like a lot of teenage girls. Guy turned out not to be a creep. My, my parents were very careful. Um, so that was always a side thing available to me um, it, while I was either in school or working or both. But then when I moved to L.A. in graduate school, I moved to L.A. Uh, the day before 9-11, I remember. <laughs> mm. And then it was very easy to have a headshot and model a lot more because it's LA, right? There's just more production going on all over the town. So um, while I did my MBA, I modeled, dated a few rich guys. We could, we'll talk about that. Um, why not? It was fun. I'm not sorry. There's no crime. There's no sin. I was a, was a pretty girl and they were super fun. They, of course, also had to be nice and sane. I never, nobody was ever mean, but it was honestly, it was just dating but with guys who could help me out because I was, you know, a broke grad student and uh, no one was upset about it. I, I really will never understand why society is so upset about it. Uh, and again, not all people are, but the ones who are make a lot of noise. So um, so did all that and um, and then got into flying. Uh, first, it was a hobby. I think it's in my blood. My grandpa was an aviator. And then I decided I wanted to fly bigger, faster stuff. It, it turns out it's a very expensive hobby above what I can afford. So I decided to fly professionally uh, uh, so that I could could fly more and um, somebody else would foot the bill, basically. Uh, then uh, dated one person very seriously for about five and a half years, then another one for about four and a half years. That ended last year, and I apparently had a midlife crisis and decided to move to New York. <laughs> uh, I had wanted to for decades, honestly, like many people. This is not unique. New York is before you continue on, I have noticed a lot, a lot about that. Like a lot of people, if they don't live here, they literally even live in Texas or New York. Those are the two states that a lot of people who like do adult work, modeling or in the entertainment industry end up moving to New York. I don't know why. Is there like something there that sucks them in? Well, there's a lot of broadcasting here. Broadcasting and and entertainment was traditionally New York and L.A. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty normal. Also, uh, it's fun. And uh, maybe entertainment types and uh, even adult entertainment types. We're kind of, we like, we like fun. Let me look what we chose to do with our lives. Um, I pretty much do what seems, what interests me. I'm a, maybe a little selfish in that way. Although I think I'm a very good friend and lover and daughter and neighbor. Um, I am going to have fun in my life and nobody's going to tell me not to. And New York is every bit as fun as I thought it would be. So I figured if I didn't do it now, I never would. It would be my Moby Dick's white whale and it would be this thing that I wish I had done. So I better do it now. You know, I have aging parents. I have other commitments in life. The next chapters after this probably will require me to come back to California, although I'm not sure how it'll go yet. But so I, you know, I'm not rich, but I could finally afford to live here without starving to death. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this lifetime, I, I am not a wife at this time. I did not have kids. but I was going to do a few things that I wanted to. And one of them was live in Manhattan. And uh, I've been here about a year and a half and it's awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So what was your upbringing like for you? Yeah. So I'm a professor's kid, hence the eternal curiosity uh, and the ner nerd on the inside. I'm most alive when I'm experiencing something I don't know about. I'm very curious about people and the world. And if I was a billionaire, I'd probably just go keep getting PhDs or something. And I think that's the blood of being a professor's child. Um, and my mother and father are still married. Uh, they certainly had their fights and things, but nobody was ever leaving. They do not like the work I've chosen, but they love me. Uh, and that is 
something for which I'm so grateful. I don't deserve that and I can't repay it. Um, but they choose to love me in spite of my choices. And uh, I'm so lucky because a lot of people who do the work I do are abandoned by their families. And uh, and that's very hard for them. It contributes to um, mental struggles and self low self-esteem. And I, I stumble along a little bit with a little bit of ability to hold my head slightly higher because my family stands behind me, even as flawed as I am. And the shame that I may have brought my family, for which I'm forever be sorry. I wanted them not to know. I tried to lie. I was closeted for years. Didn't work out. Got outed. That happens to many. How, uh, could you explain how that happened for you? Like, oh, was it like okay. did someone well, in your family like release what, what you were doing or just came on in the media? I mean, yeah. So the way that happened to me, uh, when I first started, um, I was immediately successful because I'm, I like dating. I like men. I, I'm a night, I'm a reasonably nice person. So it was, you know, not exactly rocket science. And there was a gentleman, well, he's not a gentleman, a man who owned a site called the erotic review. And, uh, he charged men to read reviews of sex workers. And these reviews said that you sold sex, which I never have and never will. You are not, no one is entitled to my body unless I want them. No amount of money, no, job connection. No, I've never been forced to have sex. I have sex with whom I want, when I want, and why I want. Uh, and liking rich guys does not make you some slave. <laughs> so this guy, explicit reviews that said, you know, the guy could hand out this amount of money and demand access to whatever he wanted to your body, as if you were some kind of robot or series of parts, as, as if you were not a human being. He uh, got in touch with me I guess he had heard about me and wanted me to demand that the men that I had met write reviews, he would make money off them, right? Charging people to read them. And his pitch to me was that I would be more successful, be able to make more money, meet more connected men, have a better life later, whatever, if I got in cahoots with his site. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I read this stuff, which blatantly said you sold sex and I'm not a robot and I'm not uh, available for sex to anybody who can write a check. That's insane. And I do not like to be told what to do. I guess that's, I'm slightly Italian and Eastern European, and, uh, I am not going to be owned by any man ever or woman. Mm -hmm. And so I told him to, to go pound sand. Uh, it turned out that was a pretty bad idea. I didn't know who I was telling <laughs> off <laughs> mm, too, too headstrong. Uh, and so over the years, as I continued to succeed, and so did he, I had heard from friends, colleagues, women, that they had to go to his house and sleep with him. He would write other good reviews and take out any bad ones if they did what he wanted. If he if they didn't, he would put in fake bad reviews and destroy their ability to pay for food and shelter. I sort of was telling women, you don't have to be owned like this. You don't have to do what this man wants. Meanwhile, he's cornering the market, placing ads in the front, front pages of Playboy, getting on Howard Stern's show, uh, with advertising, he was cornering the market. He was smart. It was a searchable engine of you plug in these parameters and here you go, women. I mean, he's no dummy. Uh, and then in 2010, he bought my legal name, uh, .com, and he outed me to the world. He put my address. He put my parents' information. He put a lot of lies. Oddly, he put that I failed out of college. I'm not sure why he wanted to say that. I didn't, but um, okay. He put that I sleep with animals. I do not. <laughs> um, and uh, and then he put at the end, uh, you, Amy, answer this email or things will get worse for you. I had no idea who had done that. Uh, the, he had sent paper copies it, of it to my family um, and to my, at the time, boyfriend. I, was, I had fallen in love and in 2010 was going to retire and marry this guy. We were actually pregnant. Uh, I didn't tell people I wanted to just ease out and quit and keep my personal life private. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out. Uh, I miscarried my 17 week old son. Uh, I lost my job. I lost my boyfriend. My family didn't talk to me for two years and I was consumed with getting justice. And uh, I didn't know who did this. And the only way to risk to retrieve the private registration of this URL was to file a lawsuit and a police report. Mm the danger in doing that, there was some considerable danger and also outing myself in the public records suing. Uh, but I didn't care. I decided to do both and whatever happened to me would happen. I talked to my lawyers. I have the world's best lawyer who has literally saved my life. 
Uh, it's a great friend of mine for decades who's not afraid of anybody. Uh, he's the only person more idiotically bold than me, maybe. And we did it. We uh, And then the private registration was revealed. We found out it was this person who owns this review site. I called him. <laughs> Stupid. My lawyers told me not to. And I said, I remember I was in the grocery store shopping for salads, lettuce. And I said, I know you did this to me. And he said, if you come to my house and sleep with me, I'll take it down. I was just about to bring that up. He was blackmailing you for that reason. To come and I said, I'm going to destroy you. <laughs> and I didn't mean, I meant only legally, of course. I don't do mm -hmm. anything. I don't disobey the law. Uh, and so I sued him and I won. Uh, and then he came in, this is now a couple a year later, he tried to murder me in Phoenix, Arizona, where I had gone to live to, to get type rated in some planes and teach flying. Uh, and the major offenders unit in Phoenix arrested him, put him in prison for a few years. Uh, he's out now. The vi the victim services unit alerts me of his, uh, the, his whereabouts to the degree they know forever. Mm -hmm. uh, he has changed his name. He's tried to clean up his life. He has a job. I, I pray to God that he does. He has a daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, and so far, I'm still alive. And I hope that remains the case. Mm -hmm. Damn, that's, that's, that's how I got outed. It was that's awesome. Scary. That's scary. That's scary. Well, there, it turns out in this world, there are men and women who think that uh, sex workers are property to make money off of. And if you defy them, they want you destroyed. This happens on the street every day. This is what pimps do, right? Mm -hmm. This was the online version of that. That's 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 scary. There's so people he, who think they can from, control other people. So he went from helping you out to promote to promote you on a website to just like harassing you didn't. Like completely. No, I was never. Completely. I was never part of his website. I refused oh. to be from the very beginning. I never wanted anything to do with him. The reason he hated me was that I would not participate in his review scam scheme. I didn't want anything to do with. I. I have not. I have no interest in pimps on or offline. That's good. That's good. That's good. So the reason he hated me was that I was not interested in help. I don't need help. I'm. I'm nice looking, pretty, kind. I love men. I love dating. I don't need help. Mm -hmm. So I'm with the pimps on the street would call a renegade. That's a woman who will not be owned. And uh, pimps on the street, they kill renegades. And this is the same idea. Mm. You will be owned and you will obey and you will give your money or or indirectly you will allow a pimp to make money off of you or you will die. Mm. So, so how did you get interested in the escorting job then? I mean, I in college. Uh, the I uh, was candy striping and a guy who was finishing med school wanted to date me and he offered to take me to the opera and and send me to his personal shopper to buy the dress and shoes beforehand or I could date frat boys that wouldn't even buy me dinner so who would you're a pretty girl in college who would you choose mm -hmm. and he was nicer and smarter and better and he was 9 years older so he was better in every way so I was easily able to date men who treated me better. So I did. This is a very common story. If you're a good looking young woman who doesn't like being poor and being treated badly by men, because they all want the same thing in the end, you go for the one who treats you the best. And yes, some of that includes finances. Not all. Again, he was also nicer and gentlemanly. He was actually more gentlemanly than the ones who did nothing for me. Mm. I didn't have rich parents. I didn't have, you know, so, yeah, who would you pick? The guy who says, do you want to go to Tahiti for a week? Or the guy who says, like, let me sleep with you without even buying you a glass of wine and then never call you again. Mm -hmm. So it was natural. And then I learned about this. I had a sorority sister who was doing it. And I was like, oh, that's kind of the same thing I'm doing just with this one guy. And then he and I broke up and I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. It's just dating. It's literally just dating. It's the same thing everybody else does. There's nothing that's that interesting about it, except the world is for some reason, they think it's like some really super weird, exciting thing. It's totally not. It's just dating. <laughs> so do you have any stories from that time? Any crazy stories? Funny stories? Crazy. I mean, I get crazy. I get a hundred crazy emails a day from psychos who would never be allowed anywhere near me, but that's not, those aren't real guys. The nice guys, they just, it's a date. It's the same thing everybody's doing on Tinder, except the guy treats you better and effectively buys you an outfit or, you know. So in the world of wealthy men and beautiful women, wealthy men are not stupid. They understand how much money it takes to be a beautiful, polished woman with great fashion, great hair, great skin, great nails, trainers, uh, 
the time to be available. Some CEO who's got some huge job, he has this time to take a vacation. If you've got three three jobs, you're never going to see each other. Mm-hmm. And if he makes millions of dollars a month, it is so much easier for him to just retire you. This is totally normal in the world of the wealthy. Nobody, nobody hates it. I think it's just the people who aren't wealthy are, they can't comprehend this because the wealthy do live very different lives than normal people. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not wealthy. I've just seen this world because I've served them. Of course, the, the rule is that they have the financial power and they can dump you when they want, but you can also dump them when you want. No man's ever held me hostage if I didn't like him or wanted to not date him anymore. And that has happened. Um, crazy stories. I mean, it's just dating. So sometimes there's sex, sometimes there's not depends if I wanted to. And they did. Um, that's pretty much just like any other romantic relationships you have. Uh, some men make a big, I mean, I met one guy once who started crying and was like, I can't do this. Uh, and, uh, it paid me anyway. And I left and some people make a big deal out of it. I, I think maybe because they've provided financially, they're worried you don't really like them. Well, I could argue the same thing it, because you want me to remain beautiful. And because sometimes you're hoping for sex, I could argue none of those kind of guys ever really liked me because mm-hmm. if I had been ugly or if I had not been sexy, they would not have spoken to me. I think you can either be mad about the the differing needs of people or you can just work with the world that is. I choose to be okay with the world that is because raging against it. Look, you are never going to stop beautiful women and rich men from finding each other. That's very true. Yeah, you're right. That has always been the way it is and it always will be. What, however they find each other, fashion shows, pageants, internet, dating, matchmakers, they always will. And rich men will always provide and beautiful women will always be beautiful and accommodating. And that's not a bad thing. So it's not really that crazy. Most high powered men, they just work a lot. They're busy. They they want to have a nice dinner with somebody who looks good and is nice to them. <laughs> um, most women are not nice nowadays. They're very most- catty and mean. Most women are not. Yeah, I don't know much about the world of younger men. I've had a couple of younger clients. They were lovely. But I mean, I do a lot of work to handpick better people. So no one gets through the barrier if if they behave idiotically. So I don't know. I I don't see that most people aren't nice. Because they don't get access to me if they're not. Um, I'm not talking about men. I'm talking about women. Some women are not nice. Really? Yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't know why. I do. I don't know if they don't. They are unhappy or. I I never understood that either. Yeah. I mean, I don't think happy people can be cruel. I think anybody who's being mean to somebody is in pain. Mm -hmm. And I'm not excusing it. It's still not acceptable to be cruel. For me, if I don't like somebody, they simply don't exist to me anymore. Bye, onward, delete, you know. I don't have time. I'm 47 years old now. I, I'm going to be dead in a few decades. I am not going to spend one second on people who are not nice to me. Later. Um. So, I yeah, when they, like, internet fighting and drama, I assume that's out of pain and maybe boredom. Um. It's never gotten any any society or human being anywhere. A woman who's mean to man, you're not going to find love if if that's what you want. If you don't want love, then why bother being mean to men? Because you're wasting your time. I, yeah, that's I what I was going to go about. Like some women are like, we're all the like the single nice men, and then the other other women are the other women are like, we're all like, why are all men so rude and obnoxious and all that stuff? Like, I never understood that from a guy's point of view. It's like, how about just try just try being nice to a guy and hope. You'll appreciate you however you are. Some of them go a little too far, but they're thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's tough out there. Um, people have a lot of pain, unhealed trauma. You got to fix that because it's going to keep revisiting you. Um, and yeah, when, so a lot of people say they want somebody nice, but that's not what they're going for. Uh, so their actions belie them. Like a lot of men will say, I want a good woman, but then they go for the Instagram baddie. And I'm not saying she's not good, but but you are not chasing good. You're chasing hot. Mm-hmm. And so be honest. You want hot. Fine. Or women will be like, I want a nice guy. But then they 
chase the bad boy. Well, just be honest. You want a bad boy. It's okay. I wouldn't recommend it, but, uh, but you do you. Um, I think much pain is caused by not being who you really are. If you want to be single, I think a lot of people are a walking contradiction. They say they want love, but none of their actions lead to love. They, they clearly want to be single and that's okay. Um, but I think the golden rule applies. You treat people how you'd like to be treated. And then, yeah, sometimes you're just incompatible. I've certainly had clients where you just, you're incompatible. So you have a nice time and then night have a good life. It's okay. Mm -hmm. It's not personal. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly, uh, the fact that I prefer rich men who protect and provide, which in my opinion is completely natural. That's the way human history has always been. It's changing rapidly now, and that's a good thing, but that's not the world I come from. Within my lifetime, women couldn't get a mortgage or a credit card without a male cosigner. So I didn't come from a world of women making having equal salaries to men. They many times do now, and that's great. And men will have to adapt. They'll have to provide something other than financial support when their girlfriend or wife makes more than they do. And we'll see how that shakes out. And it, I think it's going to be good. My sister makes more than her husband, and her husband's a complete partner. And they're totally in love, and it's great. Um, but the world I grew up in, uh, men provi provided and protected, and that was what was natural and normal. And so that's what I like, and that's what feels comfortable to me. The only men who are angry about that are the ones who are unable to do so. Mm -hmm. In which case, I wonder why they care. Like, go find a go find an independently wealthy girl. There's lots of them nowadays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, and. Well, being cruel never got anybody anywhere. So people need to take a beat and approach each other with more kindness. I mean, what is the Arab saying? An eye for an eye and the whole world goes blind. You can't hate yourself into love, right? Hate your way into love. It's never going to work. So. so after the escorting job you did, how long after did you start doing the modeling career? Oh, I've modeled ever since I was a teenager and I've modeled while being an escort. And the two are pretty trans uh, pretty intersectional. Many, many models also date wealthy men, uh, wealthy men like pretty people. So um, some of them end up, I have hundreds of colleagues who ended up married to clients or scouts or photographers. I mean, you're monetizing your looks and other people very much like to be around that either on a shoot where they're selling a product or in dating where they like to be around beauty. Uh, the two things are pretty, the 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 Boolean logic, there's a pretty significant intersection between the two. So um, obviously I didn't escort as a minor, but I modeled as a minor. Um, I modeled as a teenager. Uh, I, I did a pageant, it was super dumb. I did hometown runway shows like in the Macy's department store and junior league. Then I didn't get any taller. So then I kind of did more like uh, clothing tags, catalogs, fitness in my 20s. I still do fitness now if I get a couple of weeks to get all shredded out and stop eating carbs because um, fitness affords you. You can do it longer when you're older, um, do a lot of fashion and glamour now that I'm in my 40s. We'll see where it takes me into my 50s and beyond. There's a lot of gray modeling now where the, a very attractive older woman with silver hair can mm -hmm. be used to get fashion and perfume. I've seen I've seen a couple of those models. They look really, really nice for their age. Yeah, it's not a sort of nubile, sexy playboy thing anymore, of course. But like Elon Musk's mother, May, is a gray model and she's stunning. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll see. I might do that. I might not. Um, but then, uh, yeah, the escort thing was just how I dated. For me, it's a lifestyle. It's I I like, I mean, successful men are fascinating. <laughs> I would have, it was like an MBA course, like sitting across from somebody who's like a self-made billionaire I would have probably paid <laughs> if I had had, if I could have had afforded it, which I couldn't because they are utterly fascinating how they became who they are and the trials and tribulations, the challenges. Cause man, I've seen them through the great recession, trying to salvage things and re and recover. It's uh, it was the type of people I liked and it turned out being a high, a high end companion was a great way to meet them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so not do you uh, have do you have any favorite models that inspired you to pursue this career and why? Uh, well, I grew up in the 90s. So the supermodels, Naomi Campbell, Cindy Crawford, I mean, those were the ones I grew up on. They were like living Barbie dolls. And and I loved that they were a brand and they had a little bit of a voice. Now that's quite normal for models to have a voice. But in the 60s and 70s, they never 
you didn't have social media, you didn't even have internet. So you never heard them, you just saw them. And in the 90s, models started to do interviews and be human and even act and they own brands. Now, you know, Kathy Ireland, a a retired Sports Illustrated model, is a billionaire now in the home goods space. So these are smart women. And yes, sexy women. Elizabeth Hurley is still in a bikini on Instagram and, and she's not trying to pretend she's younger than she is. But these are women that are icons for more than just their spectacular beauty. So they inspire me. Cindy Crawford used to say that she became successful because she just showed up. She was punctual, reliable, and that was 80% of her success because most people couldn't even do that. (laughs) And I find that a lot of life is a low bar. If you can have some degree of integrity, hopefully, and show up and do your job, man, (laughs) you can win because amazingly, a lot of people just can't even do that, Mm -hmm. which is weird. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have a lot of retired uh, escort girlfriends, hundreds, who are doing amazing things. I I can't say who they are now, but tycoon in the makeup space, well-known matchmakers, lawyers, a couple doctors, mothers, wives, often, sometimes not, um, military. I mean, doing amazing things. And they typically can't be honest about their past. Some are, and Mm -hmm. people love them and choose not to hurt them with it because they understand that people have different chapters in their lives and that's okay. Um, And I love to see them blossom into who they are in their middle age and beyond because these were always survivors and spectacular women. They were always, some of them have married clients. Some of them didn't. It's fine. They're okay. The only ones who end up not okay, it's drugs. And that would have been true no matter what they did for a living. I never catered to drug addicts. The the couple clients I met who wanted to do drugs together, I refused and then never saw them again. I don't judge, but that is a road to hell. Mm -hmm. Drug addiction destroys everything good in the world. I actually don't think criminalizing it works. I don't have any other brilliant ideas. People far smarter than me have tried and I don't know, man, but I do know not to do drugs. And I do know that the escorts I know who are either dead, in and out of prison, dying, unhealthy, committing crime, lives of chaos and misery, it's drugs. Mm -hmm. It's not the sex work. Mm -hmm. So how hard was it for you to get into the industry to get work when you first got started? I know you said you've been doing it since you were very young, but when you start to get like higher paid jobs, how hard was it for you? Yeah. So first it started as a hobby. Like for most people, you're working for free, doing shoots for free. And I was in Northern California. There's not a huge market there. Um, But then when I got a clothing brand that wanted me to be on their tags and in their catalog and pay me uh, as a teenager, even in the greater Bay Area of San Francisco, I was like, oh, somebody's willing to pay me this. This must be something that wants me at least a little. Um, And then when I moved to L.A., um, Playboy called me for casting. I, I I auditioned in Burbank. Super weird to just sit there naked on a bar stool and be interviewed. That reel is somewhere in Burbank in a on a shelf. Um, now, was the interviewer a woman or a male? Because that was a awkward. team of people. I was it's a people. Bunch of people. Yeah, their offices are. Oh, very I thought simple. it was just one person, like either a male or female, just interviewing you for like asking questions and then just getting your background so they can hire you for that shoot. I don't know. There yeah, was no, they, a lot of they people have involved. multiple things they can put you in. Uh, I was denied for the Playboy Centerfold in the USA, which still makes me angry. I wasn't quite hot enough for USA Playboy. I've done many internationals, but the USA is the get, and I was not hot enough. Uh, But they offered me web. Uh, I turned that down. I did radio. I did this show called Night Calls. It was great. It was super fun. But um, yeah, I'm a a chatty bitch. I like to talk. So I guess broadcasting visited me early. Uh, but no, there's a team of interviewers and lighting, lighting people and gaffers, you know, it's a, it's a set. So, uh, but you're sitting there on a bar stool naked because the body matters. Right. So, um, it's weird, but it's a funny office in Burbank. I haven't been there in years, but you'd walk by people's offices and on the desk, there's just a dildo. And <laughs> I mean, it's a sex positive place or it was, uh, and, and I sort of liked that uh, there's room for I, I would not keep a dildo on my desk as a paperweight, but I don't care if somebody else wants to. So, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, what was your most challenging modeling assignment for you and why? Um, so on location, uh, the desert light is very good. Death Valley is the best light in the world 
or Joshua tree, you know, the desert is um, mm-hmm. that light. There's very little particulate matter. The air is very dry. So the visibility is great. Um, so that's why people do like their engagement photos and stuff in Joshua tree. Cause you'll, you'll never look better than in the desert as long as you drink water. Cause you get, you get dry. Um, so those on location shoots, uh, either the beach also, but particularly the desert, it's hot, it's dry. You're laying in salt flats and the salt starts to itch you. You're laying in sand. And, uh, the more we, we joke in modeling, the more uncomfortable the pose is, the better it looks arched back, butt out chest ribs in, but shoulders back. I mean, it's essentially yoga, very intense. And then the face has to relax because you don't want to do all that to your body and then be like, because that's not hot, right? So relax the face and move the body. uh, And it hurts after hours. You are very sore. Mm. Um, How long do you have to see in the position for it when when they ask you to like be in a certain type of modeling pose? Well, I used to, so as a teenager, they were still shooting on film. We didn't have digital, right? So modeling was different. You'd hold a pose for a long time and then they'd shoot film. You didn't want to waste film. It was very expensive. Now with digital, they can just rapid fire and shoot 10,000 shots and then pick. Mm -hmm. So modeling is almost becoming like dancing because they'll just shoot it all and pick a still. Um, However, when you're positioned carefully on something like, like a salt flat, if you move a lot, you're going to scratch your, you're going to start bleeding. Um, or if you're on the edge of a cliff in the badlands, you, you don't want to fall. Um, and if somebody's messed with your hair or makeup, you don't want to, especially if it's windy, um, the person's bouncing light off you. Uh, there can be water at like a cyclone, like Weiss's pieces in the high desert. Um, so modeling is faster now, but on location, sometimes you want to hold it. West coast. Um, like if you shoot bikini in the ocean, you want the light lateral, right? Light is terrible at noon. So you have to shoot things at dawn because you're on the West coast, that magic hour, like one after hour after sunrise and the Pacific ocean is cold. Uh, so you got to look happy and, and cute and like you're winning in a freezing cold ocean at, you know, five o'clock in the morning, you've been in hair and makeup since two 30 East coast is easier. You shoot an hour before sun sunset because it's the East coast, the sun's in the other direction. And so maybe that's why Miami is getting more shoot work than LA these days. Mm -hmm. So what is your favorite type of modeling that you generally enjoy and why? I mean, because people like beauty, I like photos that, that make people feel the awe of beauty, a, a gorgeous outfit, a gorgeous scenery, um, a soft face that looks like it's having a, you wonder what she's thinking and hope that it's something nice. I think in this world of a lot of arguing online and people being unhappy, I want to, I want to help be part of images that are bringing beauty and joy because I think, I think it's nicer. I don't want more anger. Uh, That said photojournalism, my grandmother was a pretty famous photojournalist. She's passed away now. She took photos that of war of, um, uh, factory farming animals. She took photos that were very difficult and those have incredible value, much more value than anything I've ever modeled for. But my space uh, is just beauty. And these days, you know, you get in your forties, they cover you up more. I quite like the fashion. I think that's fun to produce. The people that make beautiful fashion are incredibly creative and I enjoy celebrating them because their talent is something I can't even comprehend. Uh, sometimes you're pretty, pretty tight in these, these sample sale size two stuff. Uh, and so you can't breathe very well, but the clothing is spectacular construction and talent. And that's somebody who devoted their life to, to making beauty. Um, so those are my favorite. And also the most challenging when you have to stand in a pair of very high heels and try to make it look easy, not always fun. (laughs) So now tell us about your experience working with Playboy, Sports Illustrated, et cetera, all the magazines. Uh, companies that you've worked along in your career? Yeah. So, you know, editors and publishers, uh, editor, sorry, editors and publicists uh, get together and decide what you're going to shoot for. Um, the The magazine is going to come out at a certain time. So there's the pull letters for the wardrobe is going to go with whatever's going to be for sale then, lingerie, bikini, fashion, whatever. So uh, you get the mood board, you know what you're going to be wearing. That kind of helps you create the vibe of, how it's going to feel, 
you know, is it is a lot of black leather and PVC? Are you kind of feeling like a badass in that kind of location? Is it softer and pastel tropicals for a spring edition? Is it so, is it that vibe? So I start, it's almost like a slice of acting. Uh, bef- I get, I get the vibe and then I know what I'm going to want it to look like. Um, it's going to largely affect my face, but also the poses. And, um, and then I know my angles. That's just something like, you know, how to podcast. I know my angles. I know which, mace, which way my face and body look good and which way it does not. Mm-hmm. So I try to get in there and give them lots of good stuff to choose from quickly because everybody just wants to go to lunch and then go home. <laughs> so, um, I try to be efficient. Um, and I try to help give ideas. If the crew's never met me, they don't know my face, my hair, my makeup. I contribute when it's fashion, you bring your undergarments and you bring your shapewear so that make life easier. I'll bring my own hair extensions because I know what matches and looks better. The crew always brings them, but it's not great if it's not the stuff for you. So I just try to be collaborative when playboys asked to shoot. There's sometimes been in studio, sometimes been on location. I get the information a couple weeks before. Um, and I just try to be a good collaborator What I want is to be easy on set and and make everyone's life easier. Um, Playboy is nubile, sexy. It's trying to sort of sell a fantasy of the the incredible sexual power and beauty of women. I don't think anything's wrong with that. I think women have been sirens that have driven men to war and distraction and love forever. Mm -hmm. I think I'm happy with the way in which Playboy celebrates that. You know, it's no longer nude but they're still celebrating the incredible sexual power and beauty of women. And I think that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. I completely agree with you. I have, I have a personal problem with anyone that does sex work at all. That's their thing. That's their thing. I'll let them enjoy what they're doing. I will enjoy their work to my best of my ability. I don't have a personal problem. I uh, Funny thing is I do photography, which is more bird photography and that, but the person that got me into photography is Holly Randall who does erotic photography. So that's kind of a weird way of like, I li- I looked at her work and like, okay, I'm gonna do something like that, but in a different genre of photography. And I've been doing it off and on since like 2021. So she was my inspiration to get into the, the whole like field of photography. Holly is a fantastic soul. Yes, she is. Mother is an icon. And Holly is carrying that torch forward. And um, I'm so glad you know her. She's a beautiful soul. Her new baby is so adorable. And yes, photographing animals, I think it's much harder. You can't tell them to pose, right? They don't. Especially they don't. birds, they're hard, very difficult. You have to be sitting very quietly, waiting for them to land in some area in a tree or uh, like close by and just take a photo of it. And they are very quick. Yeah, the shutter speed and the zoom lens must both have to be very good, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. That's what... I remember being in a park one day in LA uh, and a bunch of birders were there because some beautiful little yellow warbler was doing his migration. And he sort of was stopping off at like the motel and having a half a day resting. And, uh, one person showed me him or her, whatever it was. And I would never, I would have walked by not even noticing this gorgeous little creature and then she stopped me and had me listen to his its song and a spectacular little jewel of a thing. I think she said there's websites where they trade info of where they're going and where they might be. Yeah, they yeah, they have it's called I forgot what it's what the uh, website's called, but they do have like where you can go on and you can see all the different birds that are in your state and listen to their sounds. Birds are very interesting. They remind me of humans because they're what Dan Savage and I borrowed this, they are monogamish. So birds, as you know, they pair bond, they raise their babies because it requires a lot of help. So you need the female doing her job and you need the male going and getting food. Much like humans, we're born very vulnerable. Without parental care, we don't survive. And same birds are similar. And uh, however, there's nonsense. There's lying, there's cheating, there's arguments. But yet they they clearly are committed with all the the garbage that comes along with trying to do that. And in that sense, they remind me very much of human beings. I wish someday we'll understand them more because their behaviors are incredibly complex and fascinating. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've I've seen noticed, the March of the Penguins. Yeah I've, yeah, I've noticed that a lot with birds. Like they argue with each other and they 
sometimes I've seen like two birds, if they're male or female or whatever, however they are, they like give each other food in their mouths. It's like very like adorable. They share? Yeah, they share. Yeah, I read that um, some male birds who don't, they're not like alpha, they don't easily fight and get a female. They will befriend a group of females like, I don't know if they're pretending to be gay or like not a threat, like I'm your buddy. And then the females will hang out with them and eventually they'll mate with one. Mm -hmm. Like it's a strategy and it's usually the birds who aren't as violent and, you know, pushy. And it's genius. It's like, it's like friend zoning and then getting in there with one who just decides she likes you after a while. Yeah. I've seen with mallard ducks, mallard ducks do the same thing. Like I've seen, we have a couple that come in the backyard that, and if a female comes and the two of them try to like chase her around and she usually goes up to the person that's very quiet. She'll go to him and they fly away to wherever they're going. It's like very interesting to watch like how the ducks and birds, how they like interact with each other. Well, you don't want a psycho. I read this great book. I think it's David White. I might get, I might, I might be wrong, but it's about mating strategies and the bullfrogs, uh, the, they do something called the bump test. So like they're on their lily pads, right? There's the female and the males on his lily pad croaking and looking for ladies and the female will come onto his lily pad and like, just, just bump him. And she's looking for not the guy, the guy who holds his ground, doesn't just leave and go like, I'm out of here, but also doesn't psychotically attack her because it's a test of like, I want you to have some self-esteem, but I don't want you to be an abject psycho. And, uh, and this is, if he does it right, this is the one she chooses to mate with. And it's, we are, we are exactly the same as women, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now, Funny. yeah. So now give us a behind the scenes look at what happened during the photo shoot you did for Playboy New Zealand cover in 2020. Playboy New Zealand cover in 2020. I got to pull it up. Was 2020, it? 2020, 2020. Um, oh my God. Was it, am I in a swimming pool? Am I in the desert? Oh, oh. my God. Uh, I got to pull it up. Do we have it? You can edit this part out. Uh, Playboy New Zealand. That's Maxim New Zealand. Playboy New Zealand. Oh, I'm in a black striped uh, body. So I tried so hard to buy that from the stylist. She would not sell it to me or, or give it to me. I wanted it so bad. It was such a great bodysuit. And, um, I'm sitting in front of a pool, right? Yeah, that was a great shot. Um, so uh, we had it clipped behind me in the waist because it was kind of baggy in the waist and they Photoshop it too, but it didn't look good in the belly. So it's a hair clip behind it in my spine that you can't see. And that's a house in like Pasadena. And, and the reason photographers like swimming pools, you know this, you're a photographer, the, the light reflection is always mm -hmm. good. So shooting next to a pool is tends to, it just bounces light like a giant reflector. Um, and that was closer to sunset. It was getting dark. But I have very light, you can see I have very light blue eyes. So I struggle as a model to open my eyes in bright sun, especially in the desert in the West Coast. So when it gets uh, darker, I can get a softer look on my face much more easily because I'm not squinting in the sun. It's a problem of being blue eyed. Girls with dark eyes could stand on the beach and open their eyes nice and wide. They have more melanin. They're, it's It's better. So um, as it got darker, I was able to relax my face because the sun wasn't burning my eyeballs anymore. And when when I hunker in and and kind of curl up my body, I think I feel safer because even though I'm displaying my body, I know the job, it's Playboy. I'm slightly covered and I'm not giving it to everyone. And so my natural tendency to you know, I want it both ways. I want to be sexy and I also want to save something for me. And I realize how delusional that is. Uh, so when I pose in a bit of a curled in way, I think this, this slight safety I feel shows on my face. And so they chose that photo because I felt calm and safe and it showed in the face. There's other poses from that where I felt more sexy and hard and especially in that black bodysuit. Um, but they chose the soft one. And and I find it interesting that Playboy chose that one. So, so do you, you don't get like a say of what uh, pictures they cho chose? It's just up to them? Oh, never. The editors choose because they know what they want. Um, and I sign a release once, you know, they they do what they want. And I don't mind. I mean, 
they've never chosen anything where I was like, ah, but, uh, has there been a time when they almost did that? And you were like, got to like go back to them and like, uh, uh-uh, choose a different photo, please. I wish I could, but I don't have the power. When you get in hair and makeup, you sign a release. And if you don't sign it, you, they're not going to start hair and makeup on you. Uh-huh. So, so it's like NDA. Yeah. If, if I'm being paid, I don't own the content. Now oh, I've done yeah. shoots where I've paid everybody and I own the photos. Those are for me mm-hmm. for content. And then I, then I get the say. Now, photographers retain, you know, you retain inherent copyright of all your work forever, no matter what rights you sign to anybody else, because you're the creator of the work. But most photographers are pretty mellow about, hey, if you're going to put these in a magazine, I won't release it until they get it. Because if it's if it's been released, they don't want it, right? Magazines want stuff the world has never seen. Mm-hmm. So most photographers know that and they cooperate. And once it's been released, everybody can put it everywhere because it's been used, Um but so, no, I, I've i never said to them, I'm surprised sometimes what they choose. Somebody once told me that men like straight on photos and women like side profiles, like in fit, like when I've done fitness, the audience is usually female um, and you're kind of trying to be happy. You're trying to say, I've, I've reached my goals, ladies, you can do it too. Uh, I shot once in Toronto and to make the happy faces the photographer had an air horn, like you hear at basketball games, that bah, 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 that loud thing. Mm-hmm. And the crew would randomly press it because it would make me laugh. And then the face would look good. Uh, so fitness poses are different than this kind of stuff. Playboy skews to men in their 20s and 30s, maybe 40s. So you are trying to look youthful, although they're putting cougars now or whatever you want to call they're putting hot old ladies on Playboy. I guess it's a thing. Like, I mean, I get email and DMs from young men all day, every day who want to date me. I don't know what that's about, but. <laughs> so now, did you ever go into the Playboy Mansion? If so, what was it like? Yeah, once for a charity event. They require you to uh, appear single. You can ask for a guest, but it can't be like a boyfriend that you hang out with the whole night. Uh, you don't have to be single, but. If you're a hot chick being paid and usually you're being sponsored by some like bikini or lingerie company whose stuff you're wearing. And if people ask, you hand out a card or something. Um, that's often how it happens. And guys are paying, you know, 20,000 bucks a table to be act- to have access to the legend that is the Playboy House. I never swim in the grotto. I'm too afraid of the water. I hope the chlorine's good. Um, but yes, I went a long time ago and uh Uh, I remember it had a zoo, like a small zoo of animals. And I would advise anybody who goes there that if they offer you a tour of the zoo, say yes. Uh, Because one of the things they do is you'll get like a a bunny of varying years who gives you a little tour. And uh, one of the things they do is there's a banana here and then the monkeys will eat it (laughs) and uh, and the cleavage. So, you know, that's something we're seeing if you're, (laughs) you know, it's an experience. But they, they use use the space to generate quite a bit of money for charity. And that's, that's not a bad thing. It's a lot of guys who want to meet hot chicks and that's fine. It was very safe. Lots of security. Nobody was creepy. Mm-hmm. I so met him for two seconds. He wouldn't remember me. Mm-hmm. So now when it comes to like working by yourself and hiring photographers, how do you go about collaborating with them or stylists that you want to like do your hair and makeup with? Yeah. I mean, I have crew that I trust and like. They're kind of my go-tos. I mean, now they have these apps like Glam Squad. Anybody can hire a pro to come do their makeup for even if they're just going out to dinner. Um, But I have people I know and trust that know my face and they can just get it done in like less than an hour because they know my colors. They know my bone structure. So that's easy. And I'm in terms of shooting my own content that then I can dribble out on my monetized pay site or my socials, or I can use for my portfolio to show what I look like this year. Because, you know, you change. Um, I look around at photos I like, find out who the photographer is, ask if they're available. Certainly a lot easier on the West Coast because the light is so much better. Lo- there's a whole location, like s- world in LA of places you can rent that are very visually interesting. That's proven a lot tougher in New York. Anything good is way too expensive and the light's no good. Mm-hmm. There's a few studios in Brooklyn uh, because it's cheaper, but um, honestly, it's easier to fly to LA. The light's better. The people in the, in the glamour space, there's more of that. I think there's a lot of it in Miami, but I don't know Miami at all. I've never lived or worked there. Uh, 
And, uh, and at this point, I know quite a few photographers that I can go back to if I'd like to. Um, but sometimes I like to use new people. They have a different style, a different taste. Um, and that can show more showcase more variety in your portfolio. In terms of getting paid work, there's model management apps, model now. Um, there's uh, what Vivo. There's a million apps where people are looking for models. Um, a lot of times it's some creep trying to just look for dates, but you filter that stuff out. That happens. Honestly, that happens on LinkedIn. It happens on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually look for somebody whose work I like and then see what their terms are and if they're amenable. Um, sometimes, oh, sometimes they have crew that they prefer to work with. A lot of photographers are like, Hey, this makeup artist knows what to do for what I need for my lights and my camera and my, you know, and that's fine. I'm happy to hire who they like, uh, or if they don't, if they want me to hire, that's fine too. So, um, every case is every shoots different and it's a bit of uh, project management, right? Putting the pieces together and, uh, the weather is tough in New York. You can plan all this stuff. I did a shoot last year and it was the heaviest snowstorm day of the entire year. And we were in uh, near Madison Park and we all just hunkered down on a snowy day and got it done. Uh, thank God, because I was worried it was going to ruin everything. Getting there was very difficult for people that day. Mm -hmm. So do you have any photographers that you enjoyed working with and why? Yeah. I mean, there's so many good ones. Uh, Ryan Dwyer in Los Angeles is fantastic. He's like this big, tall surf bum, totally loyal to his wife. Doesn't creep on models. He works with beautiful women all day. He's not, he's a professional. Mm -hmm. He gives great direction. He's, his retouching is good for the glamour type. He knows what the world wants. His stuff gets published a lot because he knows he is prompt. He's reliable. If you're hiring for content shoot and paying, his prices are fair. If magazines are hiring, I'm assuming that's true. I don't know. Uh, he's a good guy, like just an all around mensch of a guy. I've shot with him many times. Um, Brian B. Hayes is great. Julia Mindar is a former model. She's Ukrainian. She's very dry sense of humor. Hilarious, you know, Russian type of. And she's gorgeous. I always feel weird shooting with her because she's, she's prettier than me. I'm like, you, you, we should be in the opposite places. Um, and she's a badass. rides motorcycles, dates who she wants. I mean, she's a badass. She's like a Angelina Jolie type of a woman. And she also understands what, what glamour will sell and her stuff therefore gets published a lot. She's a hard worker, never late, never flaky. Yeah. I like, I like her a lot. So. <laughs> So now how do you establish a fixed modeling rate when you're working with professional companies or photographers that you work with? There is, not a fixed, there is not a fixed rate. Every case is a negotiation. Um, if Frankly, you know, for a lot of the big fashion covers, like I've been on um, a couple international L's and a couple of international Lofis Yells. L did not pay anybody. Mm -hmm. We all worked TFP, which means time for print. We all worked for free. You know, when people are shooting for Vogue, they're typically not being paid. It's expenses only. Um, because they want the the feather in their cap of being in vogue. Maybe some people get paid for that, but the the dirty secret is the big boys because they have the clout. They don't they don't always have to pay people, mm. and why would they if they if they can? So um, the most famous photographer uh, Robert Seabree that I shot with, I worked TFP because I wanted so badly to work with him. So it was my expenses were covered, but I didn't get paid for that day. And no regrets. He's a spectacular person and a photographer, and I'm glad I met him. So um, there is no fixed rate. I can suggest my rate, but um, and I do have suggested rate plus travel plus things like that. Most people comply with them. But if it's somebody who's a huge name and has a lot of leverage, <laughs> they're probably not going to comply with my demands. Mm -hmm. so now, what financial advice do you have for newbies just beginning their career as a model? Oof. Uh, live beneath your means, um, <laughs> and save your money. It's a short career. Even if you have longevity, um, just, uh, if, as you make more money, you know, don't worry about it in the beginning, but as you make more money, you want to have a CPA, you want to have a financial advisor, uh, because this is not your area of expertise and you investing on your own. Yeah. You could just do Vanguard funds and standard stuff, but if you're going to try to play the stock market, you're going to lose. So you're not smarter than people who are professionals. Uh, but horse, first things first, when you're first making money, just 
don't go out and buy every bag you see because you got a big check or uh, live beneath your means because the more comfortable you are when you're old and you've got healthcare bills and you're on a fixed income, the the safer you'll be. And I know it doesn't feel like you're ever going to get old, but if you're lucky, you will. We all do. Now, why do you think there's still a, st- a stigma and shame around erotic modeling and people who work in the adult industry or do OnlyFans? Oh, this is such a good question. And thanks for humanizing a person who's done sex work. And sex work, the umbrella connects OnlyFans, strippers, escorts, uh, porn stars. Uh, it's it's meant to be an umbrella to, to and I would argue sexy models are sex workers, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, dominatrixes, uh, dominators, there's male doms, there's man ones too. Uh, anyway, I think, I think there's a historical cultural context, you know, America particularly is a very large, very religious country. Most countries that are larger than us are sort of less puritanical. Um, and that's a historic perspective of people should be sexually modest. It, uh, I think some of it's religion, right? It's some people think that sex should not a sex or sexuality showing skin behaving in sexy ways should not occur outside certain bounds such as marrow marriage mm-hmm. and that if it does it's immoral um and therefore that any kind of erotic work is sort of degrading and sinful um i think a lot of men don't want the whole world to jack off to sexy pictures of their woman uh, you see that in a lot of the world covers up women. A lot of animals, the female is kind of drab colors to stay in the nest and protect the babies. And the male is the flamboyant one. He risks getting noticed, getting eaten by predators because he's the one who's got to go out and find a mate. And the female is sort of gray and matches the tree because if she dies, the babies die. And so, again, we are not birds, but I think men often want to protect and provide for the woman they love and the maybe mother of their kids, or at least the woman they love. And therefore they don't want her tempting the, the desire and chasing of a bunch of other dudes. Cause they're like, I don't want to have to fight these men off. I don't want to have to. And there's a shame thing. If all their buddies are going, your wife's a gross whore. That's not fun for men. And I understand that. I would argue men should stand fast in that. Even if your woman is a pageant woman's, who's got bikini photos online or she's done Playboy and lingerie, if she loves you, she's not sleeping with your neighbors. And also not everyone's monogamous. Some men don't mind it, but the ones who do, the Mm -hmm. majority who probably don't want her sleeping around, I would argue you have to trust her. And that even if every man on the earth wants to have sex with her, you have to trust your woman if monogamy is your thing. Um, I think a more valid concern about why there's stigma about sex work is uh, the moral and ethical concern. Uh, exploitation and coercion. We talked about the pimp who outed me to the world, ruined my life for years, mm-hmm. and then almost tried to kill me. Uh, there, there's a pervasive belief that the that sex work exploits workers, and that's not entirely false. The workers are young, often poor, and uh, often a little naive and powerless. That's true in modeling too. Runway models are often underage. There is no union. There's no rights. It's changing. But when the workers are young and powerless and the others are older and powerful, you often have some pretty predatory behaviors. Uh, However, that does not represent all experiences of sex workers at all. Um, So we can do better for workers' rights. That's some of the work I try to be involved in without thinking that we can just criminalize or abolish our way out of sex work because we never will. (laughs) Um, I think some people claim that it perpetuates women as sort of bodies for men to consume, um, harmful stereotypes and gender inequity. Well, women's bodies have been the subject of art for most of human history. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They are a very has. nice shape. I don't know that we can, when, you know, there are men being sculpted too, the David, right? There's mm-hmm. so, uh, But there is some concern that it reduces people to the physical. Uh and then, of course, the legal stuff where where sex work is criminalized, that compounds the problems for sex workers, the legal protections, the degree to which they can go and speak to law enforcement about predatory people, the degree to which they can defend themselves against harm. If their work is criminalized, you get an underground economy. 
People won't talk to law enforcement. They won't talk to legislators. You ha- you get no data about uh, assault, rape, disease, and you just don't know what's going on. In Calcutta, where they've decided to uh, decriminalize, you've rescued like were they twelve hundred women last year from trafficking. Uh, they've started carrying condoms because they're no longer arrested with those used as evidence. The HIV rate has gone down like 1% per year for like five or six years now. Uh, decriminalizing has absolutely helped in every single way. But they had to have a shift into viewing this problematic industry as worthy of rights and respect, at least more than it did get. And and that's, you know, a pivotal, that's a pivotal cultural shift that I don't see in a country that socially ostracizes people who choose sex work. Mm-hmm. Which to me is really dumb. Let people do what they want to do and let them enjoy. It's their body. They will enjoy what they like. Just mind your business. That's all I say. People mind your business and let people do whatever they want. You don't even have to like sex work to know that it needs improvement and that these are human beings worthy of rights and respects. New Zealand decriminalized because they understood that the the lowest end of sex work, the people with the fewest options, the most poverty, the least power, you needed to protect them too. And they've had great outcomes too. So when you criminalize something, I was in Pakistan, alcohol is illegal, it's Muslim, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone who's in power there or connected to law enforcement or who has who has an out is, is having a drink every night. And only the poor and vulnerable catch a case end up in a terrible prison or just die in the street unable. I mean, when you create a criminalized system, it's the poorest and weakest who suffer in the courts and cases because they can't afford to fight, right? So either either you care about the poorest and the vulnerable among us or you don't. And I don't know how to talk to people who simply don't care and want to and are driven by spite and a need to punish. And I think some extremist religious people are driven by a need to to punish those who live differently from them. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a real shame. It destroys societies. It does. Mm-hmm. So besides modeling, escort, the escort job you do, what else are you passionate about? I mean, I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a dog mom. I'm a friend, a neighbor. Um, I like to fly planes. I like to shoot guns. I do a a lot of yoga, try to stay fit. Um, I do love to travel. I want to see more of the world. And I've already seen a lot. What have I been to? Like, I think like almost 50 countries, every continent, but us, but Antarctica. I want to see that one soon, maybe this winter. Um, and I, I want to be a good friend to the family I've built because I I wasn't blessed this life with children. Next life, I'll join that sorority, I hope. Um, But I'm passionate about hopefully being a source of fun. I'm a great hang. And uh, and, uh, I'd like to fly some different types of planes if I can, if I can still pass my class one medicals for a few more years and stay healthy. I'll keep doing that. Um, I once thought about going back and finishing a PhD, but I haven't moved on that. I don't know. Maybe I will when in my in my old lady years. I don't know. So uh, you just mentioned about traveling. What's been your favorite countries that you travel to and what's been your favorite culture to experience? Oh, that's such a good, there's so many. And part of being a high-end escort is I've had the privilege of a couple of my favorite clients so generously took me all over the world. One that, uh, unfortunately we're not friends. We, we broke up. And even though it was a client, it was like a real breakup and he's fine. He's doing better than ever. And I'm happy for him. And also a little verklempt because I'm human, but he's great. But he and I went to Africa, Caribbean, Mexico, uh, oh, I mean, all over Europe, all over the States. Um, I've been to Hawaii, uh, Latin America. I saw a guy for years who was, who's was grew up in Latin America. We went down to many times, Brazil and Ecuador and Argentina for pole. I've been to the polo open a few times. It was fantastic. Canada, I've been heli skiing, which is um, incredible. And I wish I could afford it on my own. I can't. It's so much better than regular skiing. I wish I was rich. Um, and uh, and then with my family, my father was a refugee from Europe. I'm uh, He was stateless until uh, he the U.S. gave him uh, amnesty. And then he got married and became an American. And he was kind of wanted here because he had science skills and 
was educated. So they fast tracked him, but my father had no papers until he was in his thirties. And, uh, and so because he's got family all over the world, I, I traveled quite a bit. My I have family in Thailand and London and Turkey and Eastern Europe. And, um, so my favorite overall, oh, that's so hard. I think North India, the Delhi was the most beautiful, the, the Agra Delhi Jaipur mm -hmm. triangle. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Turkey is incredibly compassionate. I love their relationship to animals and they are so kind and loving. The Turkish people are incredible. I think Greece is visually beautiful. It's very dry and it's water and sand, very much like Southern California. Cabo San Lucas is stunning. I mean, there's so many. It's I can't I can't just say one. Mm -hmm. So now do you watch any shows or movies? Yeah. Uh yeah. I'm a big Netflix and late night snacks fan, um, which is hard when you're modeling. You got to stop that a couple of weeks before shoots. Uh, yeah, I just, oh, last night I just watched a movie. I highly recommend any everybody watch these days. It's called Civil War uh, and it's on Amazon. It's A24. It's, so what's his name? Alex Garland. And it's about America turning on itself. And it's a cautionary tale. I think anybody who's who's saying they want civil war because they're mad at the other side, they should watch this because no, you don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big movie fan. Typically I watch comedy. Um, not, not, not horror. I don't enjoy horror because they typically want to kill like good looking women. And that always scared me my whole life. Why you want to kill pretty women? Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't like that about horror films. The you know what I noticed something about horror, horror films? It's usually it's a black character that dies first and then everyone else. I don't know if you noticed that, but it's always that race of people that go off the movie first and yeah. then it's everyone else. It's like, is there like something going on? Did the writers are like, we're going to pick one minority and go with, and put them in each movie, horror movie and let them go out first? Like, well, as you're easing in, in people into the arc of horror, it usually ramps up, right? Are you killing somebody off that people will be less horrified for because they identify with less? If so, that is gross. That is gross. Mm -hmm. But you're right. That's a tradition. And uh, and also the the pretty 21-year-old blonde in the tank top with her nipples showing and she's running and getting away and then she gets brutally murdered. Are, are people enjoying? Because I know I've talked to clients. They said the blonde in her 20s that every guy wanted and you couldn't have her because she could have the best guy and that wasn't you and you wanted her. And as soon as you got money, that was the kind of woman you married because, you know, now you win, but you also kind of hated her. Right. And uh, that's, that's a disgusting thing, right? The, the fetishization of killing certain types of people over others. I do not like it. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully it's changing. Hollywood's getting very good with demanding better representation in movies. They're finally getting there and it's good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now what are some of your favorite movies or shows that you enjoy and why? Well, I like comedy because it makes me feel good because laughing feels great. I love comedians. I think anybody whose mind works like that is a pleasure to be around. Uh, and I do like documentaries. I think our world is so full of interesting stories. It's like what you do in your podcast, right? You, you, you tell stories with people and mm -hmm. we have so many of them. I don't know why we ever do fiction because nonfiction there's, there's plenty. Um, I guess I'm getting into my forties cause I'm starting to enjoy history, which, you know, is something that happens as you get middle-aged. Um, I, like I said, I don't watch horror. I mean, some of the incredible dramas with good writing, of course I was a huge secession fan. It's just excellent television. Um, but I, I watch movies more than shows. I think two hours is a good, you know. So what is your favorite genre of music or bands you enjoy listening to? Mm, sounds of the sound of birds chirping in the trees, which I do not get enough of in New York City. Um, when I'm working, I listen to classical. I love the effect on my brain. I love that it has no lyrics, so it's not distracting. Um, so yeah, Mozart's my favorite, but anybody. I, I like to play piano. So I, I like to play classical too. I find it very peaceful. Uh, when I'm getting ready to work out, I will listen to something very upbeat, even EDM, like, like, like rave track techno type of stuff, because it kind of, it's just auditory caffeine. Right. Mm -hmm. When I want to relax, I like a lot of the old country music. I guess I'm American in that way. 
The problem with it, though, is the lyrics are always so sad that it's probably going to take me down into a mood I maybe don't want to have because it's always like my woman left me, my dog died. <laughs> right. So you got to be careful when you listen to country unless you want to have a good cry, which there's a time and a place for a good cry. Mm -hmm. So now, what was your first ever concert you attended? Oh, uh, Whitney Houston. That's a nice one to go to. Very first one. That's a very nice artist to see. And she hadn't met Bobby Brown yet. She hadn't started doing drugs. She was just a glowing and she did an encore. And in her encore, she, she said, this song is coming out. It's not out yet, but I want to know what you guys think of it. And it was, I want to dance with somebody. And so we heard it before it was released. And of course it slaps, right? Um, mm. She was, yeah, it was. And I, of course, have been a fan ever since. So mm. you, how about you? I listen to more metal music. I'm a metal. Nice. Yeah, I'm more metal than rock. Does it help you get out like inner rage? Yeah, it does. Definitely. I get it. That, Do you and know that when people watch um, like violent TV shows, well, not now because everything's streaming, but when television used to be appointment television and everybody had to watch it when it was on, like before TiVo, before you could watch it whenever you wanted, mm -hmm. on the nights that people would watch the horror and the crime stuff, actual crime would go down. Yeah, I was at that a few years ago. I was into true crime a lot, and then yeah. started to get a little too much for me. And I noticed uh, there, it was more towards female and less towards the male audience. I was like, okay, I kind of need to move away from this. It's just more like a female type of thing, and not really a guy thing at all. And what do you mean? In what way? Like more more females watch are into true crime than male are because. Uh, Dude, female. I know. What is this? Why do they like it so much? They like to like the psychology of all the how the killer the killers are, how the crime went down, all the gritty, nasty details. Do you think they're trying to figure out ways to not end up being a victim? Or probably, yeah, probably. That's what I think. So I have a girlfriend who's married. They live in Maui in Hawaii, and she she has a rape fantasy. And her husband, she'll go jogging in like her sports bra and shorts. It's hot there, and her husband will drive up next to her and be like, "Bitch, get in the car!" and like. It's their thing. They've been married forever. They got a kid. Like, but they had to tell the neighbors, like, this is just, it's not real. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe she's processing trauma. My sister is a rape survivor and she has a hard time watching anything with a rape scene in it, which I get. So I don't watch true crime because that scares me. There's people like that out there. I mean, I I used to watch just to see like the psychology of how the criminals are and how they think. That's my only thing. That's the only reason why I watched it. I didn't care for the like blood, blood and gore type. It was more the psychology behind the killer. I watched that one about um, Durst, where there was a documentary about. Um, he's from a really rich New York family, not Fred Durst. That's a singer. But oh, Durst, I, and he's a little I guy. The name of it. I know who you're talking about. It's my the name's blanking out my mind right now. The end. He's still miked, and he goes to the bathroom and confesses everything, and they get it. And he's on trial now. He's he's probably gonna die soon. He's like really old and frail, but his whole family is like, yeah, he's a murderer. I mean, and it's dude. I agree. The psychology. Well, anything out of the bell curve is interesting, right? Very good people are interesting and very bad people, unfortunately, are interesting. Mm -hmm. So now, what are some of your favorite genres of books or authors you enjoy reading books from? Oh, I wish I, you know, God, I wish I read more. My best local friend here is a is an author and I'm still only halfway through her book. Um, I So same way with comedy, how it's kind of a getaway mentally for me, makes me feel good and I get away from reality. I quite like books about science. As I told you, my undergraduate was in science. I was not that good of a scientist, mediocre at best, and I didn't like it. Hence the pivot in my in my work and my education. But I still very much enjoy reading about science. And there's some very good science communicators who write well. Degra Neil deGrasse Tyson, Brian Greene. There's people who write about the, the really tough stuff, particularly like astrophysics in a way that a moron like me who never took anything more than college physics can understand. So Brian Greene's Elegant Universe is an iconic book about string theory, which is one way of looking at reality is that everything is strings that vibrate and those create dimensions. And uh, I'll read it. 
And even though it's written like for a moron compared to Brian Greene, for like 15 minutes when I'm reading, I'm like, I got it. I understand. And then poof, it's gone because I'm too stupid. And I think the reason that's fun for me is it's humbling. It makes me feel small in the universe, which is important to remind yourself that it all matters and it also doesn't because you're a little grain of sand. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also, it, 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 the, maj- the majesty of the universe and all that we don't comprehend. And after I die, I hope I get some answers. Who knows? I think it almost borders on religion for me in terms of seeking what, what is this nonsense we're all doing? I don't know what this is. What is this? Right? So books about astrophysics for me are an escape. They appeal to my scientific mind. I like math. I like science. And they also are um, awe inspiring, which I like. Mm -hmm. So now you brought something interesting when we first started speaking with each other in the DMs on Instagram, which was the era of no privacy. What was the meaning behind this? Oh, God, I forgot what I said to you. I was talking about how there's no privacy. Yeah, something like that. It was very towards the end of the message you wrote out when I asked you for your information. Oh, funny. I mean, I I don't know what nonsense I rambled. Of. Depends on what mood I was in at that moment. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think privacy is becoming tougher. Um, you know, New York's about to reveal uh, release that digital ID thing. It's not mandatory yet, but I'm sure it will be eventually. Um, under the guise of ease, and it is easy. It'll store your ID, so you don't have to have it. But that means if if you got pulled over in your car and you need to show the copy of your ID, now he has your phone. Not great for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, airports now at JFK, at Delta, you have to use facial recognition at TSA. So they're collecting an age spectrum of your face as you live. I imagine for some people, plastic surgery is going to be in their future, right? Um, and people will, you know, people are getting good at like VPNs and things. They're learning. But um, I, I, I hope the age of no privacy, where everything lives forever, we know people forever. We didn't used to, right? If you, if you moved towns or graduated from school or broke up with somebody, you didn't have to know them forever. Now Facebook or Instagram sends them to you. And even if you block them, if you know someone else who tagged them, you see it. And we're not really wired for that lack of privacy, but in the era that where that's coming, I have to believe it's going to have to be the era of forgiveness because there will be no one left who hasn't had a chapter of mistakes or saying the wrong thing or getting canceled or you know, or worse stuff, you know, you got a DUI in college because you drove drunk. Well, that doesn't mean you should be unemployed and homeless forever. So France has some interesting laws about the right to be forgotten with respect to Google searches that, you know, you are a different person at different chapters of your life and you have the right to scrub stuff and, and have it be forgotten. Maybe criminal stuff, maybe lawsuits, maybe embarrassing stuff, photos. Uh, We're not there yet in the U S but I hope there'll be a backlash because people have the right to some degree of privacy. They, they have to. Mm -hmm. So now tell me about the three most influential people in your life and how they affected you positively or negatively. I mean that I know, um, my father, uh, like I told you, he's a refugee started his life fighting bombs were falling when he was born. The obstetrician barely showed up. He had lived on a dirt floor and the Soviets on one side, the Nazis on the other attacking them, having to go to Paris, not being French, being treated like shit as a undocumented immigrant. Um, and, and making it anyway and doing very well. And uh, that man has overcome things I can't even imagine in my privileged little stupid life. And, uh, and he still managed to be kind. He had no father. His father died when he was a baby and he still was a darn good father, took care of us, committed, stayed, wasn't perfect. No one is, but, um, this man is such a survivor. I remain in awe of him and all the while somehow managed to stay fun and nice. He has friends and hobbies and, Nobody retired with more healthy than he did. He loved retirement. He was just as busy as ever, but just at what he wanted. Uh, He's just a total survivor. He never quit and never gave up. And that's been a nice model for me. Um, And then my mother, 
My mother's different than him. She's not as much of a fighter, but in her own way, she's quiet and calm and strong in a, in a pacific way that is so elegant. She doesn't do conflict unless you bring it to her. She'll defend herself, but she, she believes in manners and elegance and kindness. And she's forgiven people in her life and her trauma that probably didn't deserve it. And she was able to anyway. I don't know that I could have. Um, and she's very cute and she's still feminine. She, she's powerful and yet didn't lose her softness. Uh, and, and was such a great mom, you know, ran a, ran a business from home, but also baked the cookies and PTA president. I was just so lucky. And then the last one, of course, is my sister who is running a business that is blowing up and taking off. I'm in awe of her every day, navigating hurdles and she's in politics and is in such a shark pit and also is a mother of two children, uh, older now they're college and, uh, and a wife who's still totally in love with her husband. Uh, I don't know how she does it all. I have tried to do none of that. And, uh, I don't know how she juggles everything she does. So, so yeah, the three would be my family. <clears throat> so now going back to the whole privacy thing, what's your, uh, what's your opinion on AI Ooh. and how they're trying to steal people's like artwork, photos, and trying to like let AI like get more intelligent by using people's information. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's devastating because intellectual property should matter. I, my lawyers file trademark and copyright of every, every year we file of all the content that I own. And when people steal it, if they're in the U S I do DMCA takedowns of their, I just go around them to their host. Now I can't do anything internationally. And eventually, you know, every time I do that, it costs me money. My lawyer's time is not free. Mm -hmm. So, uh, at some point, if it happened a lot, I probably couldn't afford to deal with it. And yeah, when it happens en masse with AI, most average artists and creators will not have to do with it. I, how will it shake out? I don't know. I mean, AI is not currently good enough to replace the real. Authenticity is still detectable by humans. I don't know how soon it is that that AI will be just as good, but it's not there yet. I have to think that we will forever be be able to detect that which is human and real, but I don't know. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's a very scary, I mean, right now the, the rudimentary ways people do stuff is, you know, watermarking and, you know, you're doing what you can, I'm doing it too. But, um, I, yeah, I think it's a real problem. Hollywood had this entire walkout last year over it. Mm -hmm. They wanted it to own your face and then make you and no longer pay you for your acting which is a disaster, right? You have to own your face. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's a real problem. AI is convenient. However, though, I also, in the, uh, in the area of sex work, with facial recognition coming to airports and borders, I mean, I know Canadian sex workers that can no longer get into the U.S. even for vacation travel. Really? I did not know this. They are being stopped at the border because America thinks they're coming here to do sex work which is not allowed for, for non-Americans and they're not, they might just be coming to visit their family. Mm -hmm. um, and so for them, I would say, maybe you should use AI. Maybe you shouldn't put your face out for your sex work. Maybe it should be fake. Maybe it should be real fake cartoon, you know, overlay a filter or something. I don't know, because if your face is going to ruin your life, then yeah, maybe you, maybe you do want to use AI and make it artificial to save your own, to save your real self for your real life. Uh, the short answer after all that rambling is I, I cannot predict how it will shake out, but the world has had leaps and bounds in technology before. And I mean, I still don't even like social media and I don't yet either. I do not either. I'm Thank only, you. On, it I'm only on it. So to I, I'm only on it to promote my podcast. I don't care for it at all. I saw this about you. You don't do politics. You don't traffic and hate like, Good job. Yeah, I don't care for politics. I was at one point I was on the Trump, the whole Trump thing in 2016. But I'm like, I don't really give a shit for politics anymore. It's just a clown show. None, none, both sides don't do anything. They just care about money and power. You can already clearly see that of what they've yeah. been doing in the in Congress for the last like, couple of months. They're not doing anything. All the charges that they're bringing on to their own politicians, they're not going to do anything about it. I think that's a colossal mistake. Like I am no Trump fan, but I think what they've done is a colossal mistake. 
imprisoning former presidents, or not that they're going to imprison, but convicting former presidents is disgusting third world stuff that we weren't supposed to do. Either we have peaceful transition to powers or we don't. And yeah, again, I'm no, I'm no Trump lover, but I feel politically homeless myself because I have views that are quite conservative and I have views that are quite liberal. So I don't know, vote in November or try, or maybe I'll write in you. How about that? I'll just write you in. <laughs> no, I'm not a good candidate. No. Okay. No. I don't know. My dog. It's yeah, it's a clown. Show. But that said, social media is people arguing. You should see civil war on Amazon. We we have to get along with people whose views we abhor. We have to. Because we all live here together. We're all on the plane together. We got to fly it, right? So yeah, AI, I'm scared of it. Uh, and social media, I hate it. And yet I make my money off it. Mm -hmm. So the world has always been terrible and and brilliant. You know, when the when American people were going and expanding the West and getting attacked and fighting and screwing over natives and colonizing and stealing land. And that was nobody said, yeah, this is great and easy and fun. And they survived. You know, I live where America was founded, essentially, in New York. And it was a fight then. And uh, I don't think it's ever an easy not confusing time. It just is different. It's different nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. So let's wrap up the episode by asking you a few more questions. So what is giving you hope right now? Oh, this is nice. I mean, um, young, brilliant people doing great things. My alma mater, UC Berkeley, when I, I just went and when I go to alumni stuff and I see the brilliance of the young doing incredible things in the spaces of medicine and biomechanics and and literature and art. I'm reminded that most people are are trying to continue to bend the arc toward a better world. Uh, so the young, the the good young people. I mean, again, I'm in my mid to late forties, and maybe we fucked it up. So good luck to you, kids. <laughs> now, do you listen to podcasts? Sure. Now, what are three podcasts you recommend to my listeners and why? Well, the number one is the Hawkett podcast because Amit's brilliant and he tells great stories. And um, I I do love Holly Rand, our friend Holly Randall's podcast, because it's one of the rare sex positive and less judgmental podcasts. Uh, and I think that's important. Even if you do not like the sex industry, it's worth a listen because these are human beings. Mm -hmm. That's Actually, her, her, her podcast, sorry to interrupt you, but her podcast really changed my outlook on the whole industry, how each artist are just human beings. They're just there to enjoy their art yes. and what they like to do. And most of them will have other chapters mm -hmm. in decades to come. They're humans. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, she's brave for doing it because it gets a lot of hate. Um, and then uh, I still like Joe Rogan. Uh <laughs> I, I never was a fan of him. And sorry. No, he's, he does a lot of I don't, I don't, I, oh, here's the thing. His uh, shows yeah. are like three hours long. They're too long. And some of the guests, I'm not really in, interested in to them. So I was like, I got to pick a choose who I listen to, but I never been a fan of his. No. Mm -mm. Well, he says some things that are colossally stupid. <laughs> like really the pseudoscience and the, yeah, fine. And then, then the whole, like he hates California because I don't know if it didn't want him and he's super obsessed with Texas. Okay, dude, whatever. Calm down. We're all America. Calm down. But what I like, and you're right, I only listen to like one in 10 because most of his guests I don't care about. Um, but what I like is that he chooses people he finds interesting in totally unrelated worlds. Uh, and he has the economic power to do that because he was first to the game and and exploded. I like that he just chooses what interests him in the same way that you do. There's anybody you find with a cool story to tell. You're like, let me talk to this weirdo. Mm -hmm. That's my um, goal of the show to bring anyone on. I don't personally care. If you're an yeah. artist, sex worker, model, musician, I don't personally care. If you have a story, you want to promote anything, a band, your music, come on the show. I'll be glad to have you on. Yeah. I mean, soft white underbelly, his niche is very sad and difficult. It's the downtrodden. But it's fascinating because these are people that no one was interviewing because they're not famous and they're not they're not leading great lives that we would want to emulate. So every story is interesting. And I'm a fan of anybody who's intellectually curious, which you clearly are. 
And that's why I was listening to a bunch of the rock stars and the stories were so good. Like all the mm -hmm. musicians that you've talked to, mm -hmm. dude, they have such great, crazy stories. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, better than any escort who just went to dinner with some old dude. <laughs> well, that's also really fascinating to like experience in your life, like seeing different people, having a good time with them, they're treating you right. You're getting like to try out like completely different dishes you're never going to try before. So you got an experience all that good things that no one else would. Yeah, I mean, it, it. I mean, people who like private jets are amazing. Yeah, I'm jealous that I will never ever fly private on my own. But I'm. It's cool that I've gotten to step my toe in their world, and there are costs to their lifestyle. But for sure, the food, the jets. Yeah, it's better. It's better. <laughs> um, but I don't have what it takes to become a tycoon. I'm too lazy. I'm not smooth enough. They're a different breed, and like a rock star or like any, like any kind of a very special person. I think they, um, I, I think for some escorts, it's a wild, like the ones who maybe do drugs, they see a lot of party people. I know like the smoking hot 22 year old tall blondes, they get like athletes and actors. And like, I got the guy who owned the team, who owned the agency, the like nerdy intellectual who liked annoying me. So uh, for some escorts, I think it is a wilder job than I had it, maybe. Mm -hmm. So now, if you had the attention of the world for five minutes, what would you want to tell them? This could be about anything you want. God, uh, don't, I would first say, don't listen to me because <laughs> um, I don't know shit. Um, and the second thing I would say is just stop being so cruel to each other. Like, stop this on social media and on the news. Like, I don't just mean America. I mean, everywhere, like we're all human souls. Can you just, just like lead with kindness? Because this desire to force each other into your religion, into your lifestyle, into your way of living, like stop trying to control each other and be awful. Like live what the shortest way I would say, can you just try to live and let live sex workers, different religions, different preferences like can you just live and let live why is that so hard you know in manhattan i walk by a thousand people every hour who i'm like nope and that's okay so you know just stop be kind please <laughs> mm -hmm. and lastly where can people find you online oh yeah my socials almost all of them are amy taylor nyc you'll find i'm out there mm -hmm. And you guys can follow me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, TikTok at Hockey Podcast. Everything else is really to me is always in my link tree. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, Amy Taylor, for coming on the show today. It was so fun. So great to talk to you.